I'm going to assume everyone can see this web page here. It's called resources. Can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm going to basically stick with um, this mode um, where I'm just going to basically go through a bunch of different pages, uh, web pages of content that I want to present. And I'm going to try to make this almost like a uh, like a crash course. So I'm going to give you probably a lot of material. Uh, it may feel a bit overwhelming, but like Austin said, please feel free to ask for any clarifications that you need. Um, but the goal for me at least is to give you as much to work with, you know, independently uh, that you, that you want to. Um, so uh, we'll try to get to the end and get to some examples where I can actually like work on some code with all of you and you know we can see some stuff happening but I am going to try to just present as much as many concepts as possible to you to really give you a good like set of foundations. Um, I compiled this set of resources so with all of, uh, what I just said in mind I'm not going to leave you like hanging after the end of this so you will have this set of resources which I'll update after every course if you continue you know, to go forward. And, you know, you'll, you'll have access to these. This is a public site. So um, if you maybe just write down or want to write down this part, and maybe I can uh, uh, get this shared or hosted on the event, actually, um, that, that way, you know, it's easy to get to. But just to recap, um, stuff that I'm not really going to cover is these top three links here. Um, this web page is hosted on a project site called GitHub Pages. Um, a link here. Uh, it's a really simple way to get started with a Scratch website. And um, it's a very, very simple guide to kind of go through that process. So I made this one in the same way. So um, um, I have a couple links here for some open source projects um, using the same platform, uh, which is uh, GitHub here. And um, those would hopefully let you kind of see some uh, bigger scope examples of kind of how to do this. So um, the first thing I want to get to is um, uh, give all of us like a very um, basic understanding of like what we're dealing with when we look at a web page like this um, and kind of boil it down to it's really kind of concrete elements. So um, one of the core pieces of web technology, generally speaking, and one of the first pieces ever created was this idea of hypertext, or rather like the web is founded on this idea, um, which is hypertext. And hypertext um, essentially is, um, it's sort of like meaningful text or relational text. So what do I mean by that? Um, it's text, generally speaking, that's capable of showing relationships and organization. Um, so text um, on this page, you know, we have this text here interconnected by hyperlinks. This text, um, I would call it not hypertext, um, this part specifically. Um, where we get to the hypertext is kind of like you're seeing this emphasis happening here. It looks like we have a link here. Um, we have this little footnote going on here. So this is where we start getting into the hypertext domain. Um, this is a really core concept of the web in general because the web was designed to essentially link hypertext documents. Um, the way in which that happens is via, um, you might have guessed it, hyperlinks. Um, so hyperlinks are embedded within hypertext. And this is what actually allows us to do all of the linking to other documents. So for example, on Wikipedia, Wikipedia is a great example of um, a sort of um, really valuable use or demonstration of hypertext because it actually does, you know, the thing that a lot of the creators envisioned, uh, which is linking related information and allowing us to understand that information in kind of the way that we already think, generally speaking, like 
most of us don't think, um, you know, when we're reading through a paragraph like this, we don't necessarily read the whole paragraph and then kind of like um, have a linear interpretation of what it meant. We might jump around, we might reference things in our brain like memories and stuff um, that the paragraph of text might recall for us. Um, this is really what hypertext is trying to achieve. It's trying to like uh, create a way of organizing information that um, is faster um, for us to use and um, you know, generally allows us to make relations um, and models that we didn't realize could exist before. So it's, it's pretty ambitious. Um, the design, the original design, I would say is pretty ambitious. And um, in that sense, uh, if you think that the web is built on that, it gives us a lot of potential. It gives us a lot of potential. Um, so like I said, hyperlinks, they're like a core tool used to relate documents. Um, I wanted to demonstrate really quick this early example um, that I came across recently in this um, an electronic literature course uh, that I took online, actually. Um, there's this author, Judy Malloy. Um, she was one of the early uh, adopters of the sort of hypertext scheme when all of this stuff was being developed uh, in the beginning. And she kind of um, took it as an opportunity to create some really sort of exciting media. Um, so she's, I guess, what's called like a hypertext author. And she created a series of works, a bunch of works over you know decades that use hypertext to um, achieve really complex uh, works of literature um, with all of these relational links and um, different pieces of media all embedded within hypertext. So you can see there were some cool animations that came in and um, I'm actually able to click these. These are, as you can see below, um, and I don't know if anyone's ever noticed this before, but whenever you hover over a hyperlink, this is generally speaking in all browsers that I'm aware of, you'll always see it at the bottom left there. Um, any, any hyperlink um, will give you that. So it's a neat way of kind of inspecting that sort of thing. Um, and you can see where it's taking us. So this one is taking us, if you're looking at the bottom left of my screen, to a uh, bowl helen onehtml If I click that, you should see the URL up here change to bowl helen one um, I don't know if you can see that because Zoom might be blocking it, but yeah, we're at bowl helen one So yeah, she was, she was pretty innovative in that respect, and a lot of people followed suit and um, started developing a lot of really interesting content um, inspired by that. So it's just one of the number of examples of the way that hypertext is sort of used. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be all technical. You can make art with this stuff too. Um, so just a quick note on the sort of network side of things, because I know probably some of you have heard of or have heard speak of you know, the word HTTP. Um, might have heard it with reference to like a URL, like go to HTTP, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you've ever been confused on what this is, I just wanted to give a quick sort of glance at this. I mean, this is uh, a hypertext transfer protocol is referenced here. And basically the gist is that this is what's actually used to transfer all of this hypertext that we're talking about. Um, to your browser and to other servers. The server being typically the website that you are trying to access. So in this case, mozilla.org is the server. It's serving the resources, um, some of those resources being hypertext, which we're seeing here. And um, we, the client, are uh, consuming this. And the way that we got it was using HTTP. In this case, it was actually HTTPS, and all that means is that it's encrypted. Uh, so it's um, basically encoded using an encryption algorithm. And um, if you 
are part of a secure channel, you can decrypt it and actually consume the content and load the page. Uh, hey, so that's oh, I'm sorry. really quick on uh, you mentioned earlier that this is that it was network or server related and maybe can you just briefly talk about the maybe the distinction between the server and network and then also you later said client um, so maybe we can just quickly glance over these concepts yeah sure um, yeah I'd be happy to um, so with respect to uh, HTTP specifically um, a server um, like the name suggests, like serves resources. Uh, that's the general use for a server. You might have also heard server with reference to like a bunch of slim computers in a really cold room somewhere that's ventilated well, and there's a bunch of cables everywhere and wires. Um, so that's also trying to hack into. Yeah, right. You might want to hack into a server, right? Um, so these are all kind of the same thing, um, these objects, but their goal, which can be described as server, is yeah, to provide a resource. So I make requests to a server and the server gives me a response. So this is what HTTP is kind of based around is request and response. Um, there are all types of different requests, um, which um, you can actually read about with this link. Um, that I uh, provided here, we can we can look at a couple of them. Uh, we can look at one example of GET requests. This is like the most common request. It's how we request typically a um, piece of hypertext, it's usually with a GET. Um, so that's saying me, the client, as in my browser. So like I'm using Mozilla Firefox. Um, you could use Chrome, um, but uh, that application running on my computer would be the client. So like someone who is served to or requests uh, a resource. And uh, I would make something like a get request uh, using the HTTP hypertext transfer protocol. And I would request from a server a particular resource. So that's what I'm doing every single time I visit a web page. I'm just making a series of requests um, for different resources. And usually um, it'll be like an initial request um, that will tell me the subsequent, subsequent resources that I will need. So one request will be made. And then in that response, the server might say, hey, you need a couple more things. Um, so I'll go get those other things. And that's essentially how web pages are loaded. Um, so when you're on a web page, there's a dialogue that's going on between the network and the client. Is that right? Yeah, the, and to address the network specifically, so the network would be the, uh, uh, the medium over which we're um, making these requests. So then the dialogue is more between the client and the server. Yeah. And then the network is kind of where this occurs. Yeah, the, yeah, the network facilitates the dialogue is, is definitely a really good way to put it. And there are tons of intermediaries. Um, if you're interested in it, I did have a link that I kind of wanted to um, reference to people, and I'll, again, I'll provide this on a resources page. So if you really wanna get super into it, you can. There's this concept of an OSI model, um, this open systems interconnection model. This attempts to describe the relationship within a network of clients and servers, how they should talk to each other, um, by what technology should they talk to each other? So HTTP belongs within this layer. It actually lives within the application layer uh, is where uh, HTTP, HTTP lives, you can see here. Uh, so if, if you really wanna get in depth with it, um, you, you, can, you can learn about this OSI model, which basically dictates where all of these web 
responsibilities lie. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, the network which we talk about is is sort of uh, the the way that everything is connected. Like it would describe the connection between myself, the client, and a server. Uh, it would describe the relationship between multiple servers um, within the network. Um, it could describe where Facebook is. Like if I want to reach Facebook, Facebook has, you've probably heard, an IP address. Your IP address is kind of like your address, like your street address within the global network. Um, One last quick question. Sure while we're on the topic, is the, net, is the server and client uh, thing limited to uh, the like web applications? Or is it also on software that you may have uh, that is not uh, networked or web related? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Yeah, the client server relationship is and has been used in software as like a designation for roles uh, for a really long time. I don't, I don't know where it begins. But yeah, certainly in non networked software, it's used to describe um, the relationship typically between um, anything that's consuming resources as a client and something that provides necessary resources as a, as a server. So yeah, absolutely. It, it, it goes beyond that as a lot of these like sort of software archetypes often do, um, uh, in, in, in a lot of cases. Yeah. So client server is definitely something that, and protocol, um, um, even, things like object models you'll hear used a lot, um, or uh, I guess in this case, uh, this uh, interconnection model. So whenever anyone says model, they're trying to describe like a framework of understanding for some larger design. Cool. Um, yeah. Um. So I had a question about what you meant by um, resources. Like when you were saying uh, for a server, you're requesting resources, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how, what's the best way to think of what we mean when we say resources? Is that like date? Like, uh, I guess I don't know the, the best way to conceptualize that in my head, like what that is exactly. Yeah, sure. That's a really great um, question. Um, I mean, a, a really basic resource is one that we talked about in just a few minutes ago, which is hypertext. So um, specifically, a hypertext document would be a resource that we have to request from a, a server. Um, if I'm visiting a URL, um, you know, I, I don't know what's behind that URL because I'm uh, just a, like a computer separated from um, let's say, again, to give an example like Wikipedia here, um, when my browser visits Wikipedia, I don't necessarily know what Wikipedia uh, wants to like provide when I reach the page. Um, so there's going to be a specification that it gives me when I first reach the URL that says, here's, here's everything I have for you. I have some hypertext. I might have some JavaScript, which is another core web technology. Um, I might have some even more uh, like larger resources like images, um, uh, PDFs, things like that. So all of those could be downloaded over um, the course of like multiple requests. And it usually is multiple. A hypertext document specifically will say like, like in this case, if you see these over here, um, so you see like this picture of Wikipedia. So this probably was a separate request that said, uh, you know, hey, go grab this. In this case, you can see actually when I hover, looking at the bottom left of my screen, you see that SVG. So in this case, it, there was probably a separate request just for this SVG file. So that would be a resource in this case. Um, this on the server as in yeah. like. Yeah, uh, totally. 
Okay, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the server would host all of this content, um, usually in like, I mean, a really simple server. Your, your desktop computer can actually be set up as a server, um, a mm -hmm. web server even. You, you can host a website on your computer. Um, you could make it publicly accessible and people could visit your you know, website. Um, this is kind of, and not to stretch it, but if you're familiar with torrenting, this is kind of what's happening with torrenting. It's a different protocol, not HTTP. It's, it's like P2P, just peer to peer, so person to person. Um, but if you're familiar with that, that's kind of what you're doing. You're kind of like in this weird client as well as server dynamic. And the resource in this case would be the uh, the you know the, the pieces of data that you're um, like offering to other people on the network that can see your specific resource that you're sharing. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, oh yeah, and one more thing I wanted to mention really quick. I don't know if I might have to change my view. Um, oh wait, can you still see this window I just popped up here? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, cool. So just a quick note. Um, whenever I talk about this client-server relationship, uh, you can actually open this window by pressing F12 on your keyboard. If you have a browser open, you can do this really quick. And uh, we can actually kind of confirm some of the stuff I was just talking about. So if you go to the network tab here, so it should default to console. And if you go over to network, you'll see all these requests filing in. So these are the requests that I was talking about. Um, you'll see the type of requests. We're familiar with this because I think we had it open earlier. It was a get request. And so you can see some of these. These are actually the icons that we were talking about. So. This is like a really enjoyable way to kind of, or enjoyable, arguably enjoyable for some maybe. Um, we can actually just see all of like the little elements that come together to make this big document that we have in our browser now. Um, so maybe we can even find one of these. Uh, this one is, if we look at the right here, it'll pop up, it says, uh, looks like hypertextual with an I. So we can try to, might not be able to find it. I, oh, I think I saw it. I don't remember where I saw it. Uh, in any event, it would be, oh, here it is. Yeah, so here's that particular image right here. And you know, we made an individual request for that resource because when we loaded this original document, um, it told us to basically get um, this particular resource because it needed to put it right here. Um, so I think hopefully that gives everyone at least some knowledge maybe you didn't have before. Um, so with all of that in mind, I'm going to now kind of try to introduce some of the tools that people, specifically web developers, use to build all of this stuff and what you can use um, on your own to build something like this, a, a web page. So um, the first thing I'm gonna address is obviously uh, HTML, which uh, you've probably seen come up a ton of times. Uh, you'll also note that I'm referencing this MDN web docs site a lot. Um, this is a really, really, really handy resource and I have links to it on here. Um, it's a really incredible resource. It's an effort by the um, Mozilla group um, which is like a nonprofit organization um, that builds web technologies like Firefox. Um, it's an effort on their part to like basically create a, an accessible, searchable documentation of like most web standards. I use it all the time at work. I have it up and if I'm unsure of things, which I often am, I will reference this. So um, this, um, document specifically on HTML is a great resource. You can follow these tutorial tutorials. I think are they're often very technical. Um, so I'll introduce you to um, 
some of the sub tutorials here that are more sort of uh, basic, really easy to follow if you want to dig into that. But um, getting a little bit ahead there and rolling it back to specifically what HTML is. So we talked about hypertext, which um, again is this sort of emphasized or meaningful text that allows us to make relationships, build relationships to other data with hyperlinks. So if that's the case, then what is HTML? Well, HTML is basically what we use to build hypertext documents. Um, so it's a method of organization. It's um, a tool that allows us to build um, hypertext models. Um, and um, specifically to use a word that will come up a lot with HTML, uh, gives us semantic organization. So it lets us uh, sort of like give meaning to documents um, where they wouldn't necessarily otherwise have it with just normal text. So since, for example, this is bolded, I know that there's emphasis for this uh, particular paragraph I might also infer that like this paragraph is talking about HTML because this is in bold here. Um, so like they mentioned here, we can use it to mark up and annotate text. Um, and this is what's used to build virtually, I'm trying to think if there are any edge cases that I should be aware of, but I'm pretty sure unless there's some very strange web out there that's like cordoned off from the rest of the internet, pretty much everything uses HTML. Um, it, sometimes you can use other technologies to create HTML for you so that you don't actually have to code HTML. Um, but the page inevitably will show in my browser as HTML. And I'd like to demonstrate some of this. So again, really useful tool, uh, pressing F12 here. This is often called the developer console or the developer tools. Um, but you know, you're free to roam around in here. There's no problem doing that. Um, so what I'm going to pull up here is the inspector. Another really, really useful tool lets us basically view the content for a page that has loaded. And in here, I can see all of the HTML sort of smartly organized um, by the browser, indicating to us the way in which the browser decided to load the document. Um, so to compare this, um, I'd like to show is I'm going to go to GitHub page. Um, let me go to this. So I'm going to go to the project I'm using to host this website. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the raw code there. Um, we can click this. And here's the index file, which is a very basic HTML page um, that doesn't have very much going on, actually. To give one that's a little more interesting, I'll give the one for this uh, resources page. Um, so this is what the raw HTML looks like. And the whole point of this is to organize text and give it some meaning beyond just the text itself. So a key thing I want to point out is like HTML doesn't really have anything to do with the content of the text itself, like the English. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to, sorry, I had a truck. Um, sometimes that's difficult to separate, but uh, so uh, these tags, these groups that you can see here, like H3, which we differentiate from this text here. Uh, if I change this, it doesn't change the way that the um, this looks on the page, except for changing like the content of this text. And hopefully that's clear, but saying GitHub versus, you know, the word balloon, 
that's not what's changing the organization or structure of this page, but rather this what's called markup, which are these tags here. That's what's actually changing um, the organization on the page. Um, and I will get to some examples if I don't uh, run myself out of time, but uh, I do want to introduce some stuff about CSS as well. So um, if HTML is the way that we describe the organization of hypertext on a page, the way we want it to look, then the next web technology we're going to look at, um, which is CSS, this is going to be what we use to uh, separate or clutter or cluster or give clarity to um, this organization. So that in itself might not be super clear, but CSS allows us to kind of um, kind of embellish on the existing organization of a page. So maybe it would help if I describe some of the things that CSS cannot do, which is um, I can't add words to a page uh, with CSS. I can't add a block of content, like a paragraph or a list, like you see here, to a page with CSS. But what I can do is add this color. I can change the font type. I can also um, make these lists um, spaced further away from this list. Uh, I can make the height of this line that you see I'm highlighting here, uh, shorter or taller. Um, so CSS is a lot about clarifying the way in which you convey your content. So if you're building your own website, um, if I were to remove all the CSS here, uh, these items would be closer together. These two groups would be closer together. Um, this color would be gone. So, um, I think of CSS as like my palette, like my personal palette. Like if you imagine an artist with a color palette, CSS is kind of like this. It's, it lets you impart some style as it suggests, but also it uh, lets you clarify the, the content that you organized. So just to clarify, is that a separate language CSS? Yes, it is. Yes, for sure. Um, and, and, and that's another thing we can actually see here um, in, in the developer tools. Um, so when I'm kind of looking through this inspector, what I'm doing is I'm choosing different, what are called elements um, within the uh, document. And these elements are specified by HTML, um, which again is another thing that CSS is not responsible for. I can't add elements with CSS. Um, so as I'm going through them, let's select um, one in particular. Um, we can take a look at this box, which is an element here. Um, so this box right here, we can see all of the CSS that's been applied or attributed to this particular box uh, right here. Um, in, in this uh, styles window. Uh, we can also see generically the CSS that's being used uh, using the style editor tab. And um, I'm gonna switch back to this view to just look at like a simpler example. Um, so CSS can be included in an HTML document. Um, the way that's done is just using these style tags so anything enclosed within the style tag is actually CSS. And uh, like Moses said, this is actually a different language. So it's a different technology um, that's part of the core web. Um, to break this down a little bit, just briefly, so that you can kind of understand like what's actually going on here um, with this CSS in particular, um, if you have like a freestanding reference, um, here you can see this doesn't have any like periods like this does. Um, it's just a word. 
this is going to refer to an HTML element. So in this case, we can find this element directly within our HTML code. So if I go down away from this encapsulated style body here, I can jump down to the HTML again and we'll see the body element is right here. This body element is enclosing all of this content here. So all of this is within the body. And this says font family Helvetica. So basically this one CSS rule here is saying that anything enclosed within the body should use the font family Helvetica. And if we look here, you can see this font all looks the same. And that's because all of this content is in the body of the, uh, this uh, document here. Um, we can find some other elements that I've referenced on this page or that I'm, I'm showing here. So some helpful links, we go back, you can find that here. Um, of course, resources, if we go back down, we can find that here. Um, so this is, I mean, what you're seeing here basically extends to all HTML. Um, the only thing that's gonna change is you're gonna get some tags that you may not be familiar with, um, which again, using this MDN website and these tutorials, which I really recommend, you can find that really easily, um, a, a reference to this particular tag if you're not familiar with it. So if I look at this tag, which is always gonna be enclosed in these brackets, that's a consistency we can rely on. Um, I'm, let's say I'm not familiar with this tag. I can search li here. I'll give that a try. And it's actually the very first thing that comes up. Um, and so here we find that it, this represents the HTML element uh, list item. So it's an item in a list. Um, it also gives us some rules for organizing um, list items. They have to be contained uh, inside of this parent element, one of these or one of these. So we can click on that and if we go back, we'll see that this is actually inside of one of those here, this UL, which is an unordered list. So, um, I, I have a question, oh, Paige. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So an unordered list means that it's gonna have basically bullet points, right? That, but an ordered list, would that be numbered? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, um, I'm going to try this. Um, if we can um, get it to work. So, so another thing about this inspector, it's very interactive. Um, and this is something that a lot of people early in learning about HTML find and then they get really excited. Um, so I hope it excites you. But this is a web page, you know, it's I didn't, um, well, this is a bad example. I did make this web page. Let's go to this one because I didn't make it. So it'll be more clear and you can tell I'm not cheating. Um, so if I click inspect here, one thing that is fun to do is I can actually change this content and it totally updates and responds to my changes. Um, and I can do this on basically any website that I request in my browser. Um, so uh, this is really useful, obviously, because it lets you experiment um, completely. And, and that's one of the really great things about learning to code with the web. It's, it's so easy to find examples and um, uh, kind of experiment for yourself and um, just all within the browser, you can try things out. So in, in this case, um, I would imagine they have an example on here, which they do. So we can go ahead and inspect this and try out um, Gina's hypothesis. So uh, we see here that the UL tag, the one we're familiar with now, uh, is saying that everything inside of this is going to be part of an ordered list or an unordered list, so UL. So I can actually change it to be an OL and it updated and we do in fact have a numbered list now. 
Um, so something interesting that I think maybe would be helpful maybe to solidify our understanding before we move to the next core technology. So if this is the way that I specify um, the change in organization of this content and, and the meaning of this content, so previously it was an unordered list and now it's an ordered list, um, how do you think I would approach changing like maybe the way these numbers look or um, back in our unordered list, if we change that, how could I change maybe the way these bullets look, um, maybe use different symbols or something like that, um, if anyone wants to. Would that be something that you would delineate in the CSS commands? Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's, and um, you can possibly do that really quick. Um, I will kind of cheat and um, I guess introduce a, um, another way to um, use CSS as a tool. Um, so all HTML elements, like this unordered list here, um, can have attributes. Um, so if we look back at my HTML here, you can see that some of these starting a new element here, which you'll probably realize pretty quickly is a link. Um, this is what's called an attribute. So once I start the, the tag here, inside of that initial opening, what's called an opening tag, I can add attributes. Now there's a specification for these attributes. And here actually in the unordered list documentation on the uh, Mozilla site, they actually list out the attributes for you um, pretty nicely. Um, and one, one thing I wanna point out is this is kind of contradictory to our notion of CSS, because like I just said, this seems to contradict. Um, there's an HTML attribute that allows you to style this list um, to use different bullets. So that's counterintuitive, right? Because I just said that we usually don't describe uh, the way content is presented rather than organized with HTML. And if you notice here, there's a little thumbs down, <laughs> which uh, Mozilla is suggesting like, please don't do this anymore. Um, the reason is that, you know, HTML is pretty young, relatively speaking, as uh, early as the 80s, essentially in its like earliest form, the very late 80s. Um, and originally CSS was actually not part of the core technology stack. So all there was was HTML and HTTP for um, you know, transferring the HTML around. It wasn't until a little bit later, I think it was like three years later, like 1993 or something, where they actually introduced CSS because they realized what a headache it was to basically put all of this meaning into HTML. So they built out CSS um, cascading style sheets um, in order to do that more easily. Um, but if you note here, they do give you a reference to the CSS that I was referring to, um, which will let us style our list type. And if you see here, it's way more flexible than the original spec that was only in HTML. So we can do crazy thumbs up and uh, simple circles or space counter. I didn't even know this was like a native thing, but uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, you can get very dynamic. And again, it's highly recommended to check out this resource. I linked it on my resources page because um, I, uh, you know, I'm just trying to quickly go through and convey as much depth as I can. But um, I do, um, if anyone has any other questions, just really quickly, by the way, I know I'm going a bit fast, probably, but. Uh, I have another question. <laughs> sure, yeah, no problem. So, it's been a while since I hand-coded 
anything CSS or HTML in a long time. And I know that I have some old sites out there that are definitely not the newest version of HTML. So my first question is, is it, are there any resources out there that allow you to update the HTML without going through it line by line? Oof. Um, I would say yes and no. So the good news is that HTML, as you can see here, to, just to give you an idea of how sort of like backwards compatible or, or, or the, the emphasis on backwards compatibility that the web, it's, it's actually called the web, the World Wide Web Consortium is basically the, the governing body or group that organizes all of the standards around web technology. So JavaScript, CSS, HTML, they work really, really hard to maintain backwards compatibility dating back like considerably far. So this, although deprecated, you'll note that it says here, this is deprecated, but will probably still work. The, the likelihood is that it probably will so I mean, we can even try it in this particular browser. So um, the attribute is type. So we'll go back down here. We'll uh, inspect this. We'll click here. And this hopefully will lead you to or lead us to your other question about how can we kind of diagnose these backwards compatibility issues. So if I click type, and I paste the value. Attributes always have quotes around the value you give them. So say type and then, um, oh, I'm sorry, I was putting this on the wrong place. This is actually the item in the list. So we need to put it on the list itself. And hopefully that kind of makes sense because what we're trying to describe is a quality of the whole list, not just an individual item. So I'm gonna quote that and then I'm gonna paste, oops, it didn't paste, but that's okay. I remember it, it was circle. I'll give that a try. And if you noticed, the little black dots are now not filled in anymore. And it says, uh, or it has these little empty circles. So, so it does still work. Um, the other thing I want to point out is what it's talking about here when they were um, originally implemented. Uh, if we look at this, this is actually the World Wide Web Consortium site, this w3.org. So this says 1997 for 3.2. So we're, you know, we're still supporting HTML from 1997. So, I mean, it, in all likelihood, your site, your old code that you have actually probably works just fine. Um, and as far as updating it goes, um, really there are plugins um, I believe that can let you do that kind of stuff, but digging around here, um, I know there's, a, might be in the console. There, that's a good question. I think the console will definitely help you out in terms of JavaScript, um, which is another one of the core technologies. And it'll often give you warnings about how um, and, and you can see here when I select CSS, it gives me warnings about all of these problems with the CSS on this page. Sometimes it will give you warnings about deprecated material, but I, I will look into that for sure. I've never thought about trying to go back and basically update a site. So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I will look into that. Thanks. Yeah. No, if you, if you find anything, let me know. If not, yeah. no big deal. <laughs> yeah. If it works now. It's just, yeah. oh, actually, <laughs> if it works and you have to share the web page with the group. Oh no, it's horribly embarrassing. I, I mean, it's coming <laughs> from like the time of MySpace. Don't even. <laughs> <laughs> MySpace, by the way, if, if you, uh, if you've used MySpace, you're probably a lot, more familiar with CSS than someone who hasn't because uh, MySpace lets you use styles to kind of uh, decorate your page. So I don't, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but that might have been your first introduction pin. Yeah, I think it was mine, actually. So I guess it was mine too, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
mine as well. In fact, there was a big yeah. article that came out not long ago that that's like where most girls learned how to code was MySpace. Wow. Because you can make it sparkly and add. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was really, really, they let you do a whole ton. So I, I remember it being really cool. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, so I did just find this compatibility tab here. It doesn't look super decipherable, but basically what this is doing is telling us which browsers support the features that are specified here. Um, it, it's not super readable though. So yeah, I, I will look into that because I think that's a pretty cool idea if if there was a tool to kind of go through and look at a page and say, hey, this is not the most up to date. But generally speaking, if you were going through your old HTML, you could look up all of the individual elements. And if it's not super complex, you could kind of read through them and basically collect all the unique ones like li, a, and check out uh, the MDN and kind of take a survey of what is out of date and what's not. Um, so we've covered HTML, JavaScript, generally speaking. Um, there were a couple more things I did want to get to, but I don't want to go over too much. So for JavaScript, I'm not going to attempt to um, you know, introduce any code specifically because JavaScript is definitely something that I want to reserve for an individual course because it is pretty, um, it's complex enough and lets you do enough that I want to give a very um, good understanding of at least like what it's capable of. But JavaScript, um, generally speaking, the tool is used um, for making things dynamic and to introduce changes and specifically the generation of content. So if hypertext and HTML let us create organization and structure on a page, um, the JavaScript, which you'll note here, I don't have any JavaScript on this page. This is what's called a static page or a static resource. Uh, it means there's no dynamic content. That means like nothing's going to jump out at us. There's nothing happening event-wise that's going to be triggered. Uh, but if I hop over here and I go back using my links, which again, these are just hyperlinks, nothing special here. We can inspect them using our handy developer tools and we can see this href attribute which tells us the link. Um, something important to note here is that this is actually what's called a relative link. It means that this page actually lives among the resources that we requested for the server. It's not like on some other web page somewhere um, for us to go and retrieve. Um, so if I click it, um, the server um, knows how to direct us to the next resource. Um, it still has to load it, um, but uh, in some cases, the resources often are uh, what's called cached. So it means like uh, the browser fetches them all at once. And uh, you'll find this in some cases. Uh, the only reason I describe that is like, if you're ever wondering why, um, if we look over at this debugger, you'll see stuff like this. See how there's like all these folders. These are actually now on your computer. Um, so when I went to this website, uh, it actually gave me all of these resources. And there's a number of reasons why that might happen. Um, but it, more important to note is that this page, unlike the one that I'm on right here, uh, there is no, JavaScript here, whereas there is here. So this is what's allowing for um, data, like data uh, dependent resources to be loaded. I know that sounds a little abstract, but um, for example, this um, tells me that there was a, a commit, so some activity uh, 18 hours ago. This uh, 
would be the result of some JavaScript. So this is dynamic content. I can't put this into my HTML file, so to speak. I mean, I could in HTML literally write this particular time, uh, 1, 10 a.m. I, I, I could write that into the HTML and it would show up, but it would never change. Um, so JavaScript is a way to, to do that, to allow me to use dynamic resources um, rather than just fixed static ones. Um, and, and I do plan to have a course um, coming up here, probably one of the next two, um, where we cover just JavaScript. So um, I did kind of quickly run out of time. Um, I don't know if, let me just quickly introduce this at least, um, so you can have the word floating around in your head. Um, I kind of wanted to like come to a conclusion for um, understanding the way that all of this shows up on your um, browser as a web page and combining everything we learned about HTML, the tool we use to build hypertext documents, which contain hyperlinks and are styled or um, embellished with CSS, cascading style sheets. Um, all of these resources come together, including the JavaScript, um, and they build what is called the DOM. This is the document object model. The document object model is basically what your browser, if you've ever wondered how the browser knows to put all of this here when it looks at an HTML file, this is what the browser does. It builds a document object model. Um, it kind of looks like a tree, and I think this person has an example here um, that I wanted to check out. If we go to, maybe click this, ah, yeah. So in this example of walking the DOM, he kind of goes through how in JavaScript specifically, you have the ability, the tools to reference individual members of the document model, which are specified by HTML. So the HTML lets us add elements here, like these list items and these links to the document which is what the browser builds and what JavaScript can look at and change. So it's the way that, you know, this particular time is updated. Like, for example, if I were to sit here for another hour, we assume eventually that this would say 19 hours ago. Um, so the reason this can happen is because the JavaScript on this page references this element here which again, everything is built with elements. Um, you can use this handy mouse tool to kind of browse the elements. These, all of these boxes that we're seeing are basically members of the DOM, the document object model. And this tool lets you like browse this and I would really encourage you to like load up a page you use a lot or maybe like a really simple page and just kind of go through and like try to like understand maybe some of the HTML being used here. You can see in the inspector window, if you click on elements, it'll tell you the HTML that it's attributing to them. So it's pretty easy for us to like make sense of them as we read it, like you can see the word actions here this shows up right here. So this refers to the text contained within this element, which is a span. Span is just like some text. Uh, it has an attribute here called data content. Um, in this case, we can't exactly tell what actions mean, but we assume uh, it's probably an attribute used by uh, we can assume that it's an attribute used by some JavaScript to refer to this element within the document. Um, so hopefully that gives you at least a quick and dirty ground up idea of like, 
uh, what is in a web page. You have a document, hypertext. Um, hypertext has links like this one, which again, you can see in the bottom left here, this is just a link, pretty simple. And these links relate all of these other hypertext documents for us. And the browser turns them into these document object models, which it can then use to show you the page. Great. So I guess before we conclude, uh, if anybody has any questions or thoughts, please do tell. Um, also, if something comes to mind later, feel free to uh, send me or Paige an email. You can just reply to the Zoom invite that I sent earlier that will reach me. Um, also, uh, we do uh, have a page on Mondays providing an open session for anybody who wants to talk or work on anything coding related. If you uh, go to our webpage, nhfpl.org, uh, you will see linkage to how to uh, connect with Paige and set up uh, some time on Monday evenings to do one-on-one uh, -on -one work uh, related to code. Um, so I guess if nobody, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. If not, you are free to uh, do whatever you want. And then the next, the next session like this will be in two weeks. Um, there will be another sign up or yeah, sign up on our website. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. And, and I do want to note really quick to Austin, like you said about the office hours, um, uh, de depending on feedback, and this, this is open to change because this is my first time doing this too. Um, I know I'm sure people are interested in maybe working through some examples, um, but uh, you generally have been trying to just introduce as many resources as I can give you because I know I can, you know, hopefully point people in the right direction to like learn some of this stuff. Um, and I think I can cover more ground than just doing examples. But that, that being said, um, you know, uh, I, I'm also interested in doing examples, um, especially in an office hours uh, setting. So if you are interested in actually building a page like with me, I'm more than happy to do that. So we can work through simple stuff. We can do examples of like how to actually build this HTML. Um, but I, I do hope to get to that in the next session. I'll try to work through some more complex uh, elements than what we got to in HTML using CSS to kind of change the way the page looks and yeah, hopefully more concrete stuff. But yeah, I highly encourage going to the, uh, uh, signing up for the office hours because I would love to kind of work through that stuff. I have a question. Uh, what do you call this thing that pops up when you press F12? This, uh... um, Oh, like this? Yeah, this tool again? Yeah, typically it's called either, I've heard people like colloquially, colloquially refer to it as like the console, but uh, developer tools. Um, if you actually go, for example, over here, I think if you go here, uh, go to web developer, it just says toggle tools. So tools, yeah. I, but, I was curious because it looks very, I just tried it on Chrome and mm -hmm. it looks very, very different. And I don't see like an inspector, Oh, like a, a place to select inspector. So I was just wondering if that was specific oh. to, like if, I, if it might be called something else in Chrome or. Yeah, let's yeah. Um, really quickly. Cause yeah, it's definitely, if you can use that, I think that will open like a whole world. So. It would be a good opportunity to make sure everyone knows how to access this. Um, 
let's check out Wikipedia. And um, so, so the easiest way to get to it, by the way, um, specifically to the inspector, is to um, right click and inspect, uh, in, in this case in Chrome. And when you click that, it should always give you the inspection context. In this case, I guess it's called elements. That might be why the, uh, the, the difference there. So this is Firefox and they call it inspector. So in your case for Chrome, it'll be called elements. Um, yeah, but this is the same name for it. Yeah, yeah, just a different name. And elements is just referring to each stuff. of these tag groups. Yeah, stuff, yeah. <laughs> the, the, all of this stuff on the, uh, that's, that's put together as part of the document. And this little tool here, this arrow, is the super useful one. The DOM I was talking about before, the document object model, this is basically letting you browse that DOM. So you can see, in, in Chrome's case, it's pretty cool. It looks like here, you're seeing this hover box. So it's actually telling you a lot of the CSS involved uh, in putting this DOM element together. It's telling you, um, giving you some accessibility features, which by the way, when it says accessibility, if you've ever wondered how blind people use the internet, um, you can thank the web standards group, the World Wide Web Consortium, for basically enforcing a lot of this accessibility stuff because it's the only way some people with uh, extensive disabilities, like the inability to, um, uh, for instance, use motor skills, like, um, like uh, using a mouse or something, they can potentially use speech to control um, actions navigating the web. These accessibility tools are really important for letting someone that's blind or that can't click around access content in a web page because um, we're, as web developers, kind of required to subscribe to the system of tagging and building elements. So if I know that there's a portion of the page that says from today's featured article using a speech assisted tool, for example, I might say, go to section from today's featured article. And that speech assistance tool would use this accessibility feature to kind of browse the document object model, the DOM, to find that item and then uh, navigate to it. Um, so that's just another note that um, kind of ties this some of this stuff together, hopefully. But uh, yeah, this tool is really useful. I mean, you will, if you spend time with it, can learn more about the web in general once you know where to look um, just by kind of going around. I mean, if you have your own website, you can kind of browse elements and say, you know, oh, I like how that looks. I want to do something like that. And you can click it. Um, often you can look at the uh, oh, styles right here. You can say, oh, this is the color they used. And um, this is the font size they used. So, cool. Thanks. Yeah. So great, Paige. Thank you again. It's been lovely. Um, if, in, if anybody else has anything that they want to contribute. So, if not, uh, we will be meeting again in, in a couple weeks. Or please um, convene with Paige on Monday evenings or the office hours. Uh, thank you again. Oh yeah, please, please, yeah. Oh, uh, I was just asking if it was gonna be the same uh, Zoom code or if you're gonna send a new one. Uh, I will send, at this point, I will be sending a new one. Oh, okay. That is okay. Cool. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, and I forgot uh, Rose is, doesn't, I don't think has the microphone, so I just, address. Um, yeah, uh, this is a really great comment from Rose, by the way. So I remember I mentioned earlier about how CSS wasn't part of the original spec. And this point that like the spec is in, you know, what does the web look like? What does an HTML document look like? Um, and, and as Rose is pointing out here, this is really um, uh, good information 
because this is one of the reasons why they started to include CSS in the spec is because HTML documents would become exceedingly long and complicated trying to specify the way that elements should look on a page along with their organization. So this CSS document, it can not only be separate from the HTML. So here in my example, I've, um, if I go back to this um, index, for example, let me get rid of this uh, inspector. Um, I've included the style as part of the HTML document. The, this is CSS code, but I could very easily put this into its own CSS file, as uh, Rose is suggesting here. Um, and what I can also do is reference that same CSS document across multiple HTML documents. So what that means is I can have one universal style for every single HTML document in my project. And that means all of my HTML, um, my markup, when it is used by the browser to build the DOM, the styles applied will be just completely general um, and, and they'll use the same. So this is very common. And you can imagine this kind of is intuitive, hopefully like, you know, this website, for example, they aren't specifying the font type like on every single document. This would take a lot of work. It would take a lot of effort and a lot of code. Um, so it, it's probably specified in one place and then shared amongst all of their HTML resources. So yeah, Rose, that was a good note. And what I did was very bad, bad practice, generally speaking. Dude, uh, you, you can do it for small things, but yeah, uh, you know, this won't help you in the end if it gets complicated, but. Uh, it's nice for examples because we can see it all at once, but yeah. All right, on that note, um, I think we can adjourn. Thank you, Gabe, so much. And thank you, everybody. This has been a, a lovely session of learning to code.